We're going to take a look today at uh, Physical Science 102, Chapter 21 in your textbook, Structural Geology. And this follows, uh, Chapter 20 was Atmospheric Effects. Now we're coming down. Structural Geology. We, we have, uh, in the first semester of Physical Science 101, we looked at the uh, solar system as part of our lesson plan. And we sort of dipped our toes into the possible uh, geologies of the various planets. Now we want to go into more detail and actually uh, look at the home planet <laughs> for geology because of the meaning of the word uh, geology is a study of the earth. And we use geology loosely to describe um, similar types of um, planetary processes that it may occur on, on other planets, on other moons, as a matter of fact, or other heavenly bodies. So this is our starting point, the structural geology referencing the earth. So let me share the, um, let me share the uh, PowerPoints here. Okay. And I wanna move them over where I can see a bigger version of them. All right. It'll make me a little bigger too, so I can see what I'm doing put me down in the corner okay all this stuff i'm doing you can't you can't see what i'm doing but i'm gonna i'm gonna turn this into a slideshow from the beginning here we go all right so there are only six sections in this uh chapter but uh each section covers a good bit of ground so don't let that uh, uh, a lack of large numbers of sections fool you. Okay, geology. <clears throat> I mentioned this at the at the beginning. The study of geology. Geology is the study of the planet Earth. What it's made of, um, how it's structured, and then once we get those static things defined, then there's going to be some action going on here. Uh, how do they? How do these structures? interact with one another? How do they actually cause the formation of each other? What are the forces involved that drive these processes? Um, and then we'll, look, we'll also take a look at the, the history, uh, the geologic history of the earth. When you have, to, you have to change your time frame for geology. It's not in terms of seconds and minutes and hours. We're talking about hundreds of thousands of years, millions of years is the time frame for ge geological processes. All right. Um, we're going to look at the uh, structure of the interior of the Earth. <laughs> it's interesting how we figure that out. It's a deductive process because nobody's been down there <clears throat> to see what the structure is. We can't slice the earth in half and, and look at the cross section. Um, so it's, it's a deductive pro process. It's a, it's a detective story determining what the earth is made of and how it's structured. Uh, we're gonna look at um, a process called plate tectonics, which is um, uh, a theory that has been well supported with data about how the surface of the earth, um, why and how it looks the way it does. And in that process, we'll be discussing things like mountain building, orogeny, oro referring to mountains, and uh, G-E-N-Y is the suffix for um, creation of. Okay, we'll look at a, a whole 
bunch of different things, and I hope I won't take too long. Uh, we have a lot of slides to cover, so I better get on with it. Um, I mentioned earlier that uh, geology, study of geology on this home planet of ours also helps us understand what's going on in other worlds. So when we say geology of Venus, um, it would more properly be called venology or something like that rather than geology, but we, we stick with geology for any other heavenly body. Um, if we used it in terms of the moon, we'd say selenology. Uh, selen is the prefix for moon. Okay, um, we still can't reach directly, we can't directly access the interior of the earth. Sometimes parts of the earth are brought to the surface for us, and that's, that's what volcanoes do. But we cannot go down and directly sample it. I remember when I was a kid, um, there was this experiment uh, that was performed. Um, a specially built ship was sent into the Gulf of Mexico uh, where the, the Earth's outer skin is thinnest. And they attempted to drill down through the Earth's crust into the mantle. And we'll define those in more detail in just a minute. But they never made it. Um, the, the temperature as you go deeper increases. And at some point, the, um, the drilling equipment couldn't handle the heat. So they had to give up on that. Okay, where, do, where, where is the evidence for the structure of the interior of the earth? Um, one line of, evidence is uh, generated through earthquakes. They get waves. Once the earthquake shakes, uh, it's like uh, um, the um, diaphragm on a speaker. When the speaker moves like that, it, pro it produces a wave, a sound wave in the air, and you receive it as voice or music or whatever the case may be. Um, and the same thing happens inside the earth. When, it's, when there's a shaking, you can pick up uh, that shake in various points around the globe and use that information to say something about the interior of the earth. What did those waves pass through on their way to their destination? Um, we also get clues to the structure of the earth and its composition from meteorites. Meteorites are supposed to have uh, are assumed to have similar composition to the earth because they were all made at the same time, four and a half billion years ago. All this stuff comes together and meteorites were just leftovers. Uh, comets also were leftovers from the original formation of the earth. Um, now, to be sure, some meteorites are, were produced after um, sometime after the, the solar system started to develop, uh, comets are believed to be primordial. They are original materials. Meteorites may be ejected from heavenly bodies by other collisions. So they're not quite as uh, reliable as a source of composition for the Earth, but there are similarities. We get measurements from spacecraft now uh, that we didn't have. Um, 60 years ago uh, that measure um, changes in gravity and magnetic variations. As the spacecraft orbits the Earth, it'll feel variations in the pull of gravity based upon the terrain over which it's uh, traveling as it orbits. Uh, we saw that first with um, uh, satellites that were sent to the moon. When they orbited the moon, we noticed that their uh, trajectories, their uh, orbits, would change slightly over time. They weren't where they were supposed to be. 
So further investigations found that the, the moon is also not uniform in density. There are pockets of, of very dense materials in the moon that influence that gravitational tug. But we can also measure uh, magnetic fields, not around the moon because it's magnetically dead, excuse me. But um, uh, the earth does have a magnetic field and you can pick up variations in that magnetism from your satellites. Um, and then um, one other line of reasoning is to actually go into the laboratory, uh, take rock samples that um, uh, you either collect on the surface or have been uh, recently ejected from volcanoes and subject them to uh, high temperatures and pressures and say, how do they behave? Do they change their crystal structure when you put them under pressure and temperature? And they usually do. And all of these lines of reasoning help us uh, draw a picture of the structure of the earth. Let's look at the waves that propagate through the earth uh, as a result, primarily from earthquakes. But there are, there are other sources <clears throat> that can uh, generate these vibrations. But we're gonna focus on earthquakes for now. Um, some of these vibrations travel straight through the earth, all the way through and come out the other side. But they are modified on their way. Um, these waves are classified as seismic waves, and seismology is the study of earthquakes. Um, but when they travel through the earth, um, they take a certain amount of time to go from one place to the other. And you can, you can calculate a speed for the wave, an average speed, based upon the origin of the earthquake and where it was detected. Uh, how long it takes, how far it had to go. Because we do know how big the earth is. We know the diameter, we know its radius. Um, we can um, say if, if the wave starts here, it doesn't necessarily go straight to the center, it might go off at an oblique angle. And when it does that, it may also be refracted. In other words, bent, just like light going through a prism is bent or light through a lens is bent. These waves are bent when they encounter variations in density in the interior of the earth. And I've, I've got some uh, subsequent slides that'll help uh, bring that all together. So here we have these seismic waves and they occur in two flavors, either what we would call surface waves or body waves. Um, the surface waves travel within the upper layers of the earth's surface. Um, just a very few kilometers deep, uh, they will travel along the surface. So those would just, they would go from here, and if you're going to detect them someplace else, those waves would appear uh, after they travel around the globe, not through. Body waves, on the other hand, uh, body waves travel through the earth, and they do certain things while they're in there. And we'll talk about those in a minute. Um, oh, I missed this point. Uh, surface waves are the ones that are most responsible for damage from earthquakes. Because traveling through the surface, they shake the ground. And if, if you've got a building that you think is built on solid ground, think again. When an earthquake hits, the ground is not so solid. In other words, it, it shakes. Okay, so these body waves, we're going to focus on the body waves now. Uh, the body waves uh, come in two flavors. And the best way to think of those is uh, think back to your study of sound waves uh, and light for that matter. 
um, you have two types of waves, sound waves. Um, well, actually, sound waves are, are propagated as compression waves. Right? So when this diaphragm with its, um, with its magnet back here, it pushes this diaphragm back, backwards and forwards, it moves the air out in waves, compression waves. And of course, you understand by now that gases can be easily compressed. So when it pushes against the gas, it, it increases its density here, and then that density propagates through the medium. Well, those waves can also be felt through liquids and uh, solid materials. So compression waves are identified in for geologists as P waves, they're primary waves. Um, so the, the key characteristic is that the direction of the wave, uh, the, the particles move back and forwards in the same direction as the wave is moving. Whereas secondary waves are transverse waves. They're best um, visualized as this is the direction of travel and this is the wave. So the particles move up and down along that wave. It's like uh, ripples in a pond, right? You have the highs and the lows. Those are transverse waves. Now there's some very, there's a fundamental difference between compression and uh, transverse waves, primary waves versus secondary waves. Um, one, number one, is that transverse waves will only travel through solids. They, they, they only go this way through solids. Whereas longitudinal waves, the primary waves, they can travel through anything, solids, liquids, gases, doesn't matter. Okay, that's an important distinction because that's one of the, one of the clues to what phase is inside the earth. How do we know that there, uh, there is a liquid phase in the earth? Um, the other main difference is that uh, compression waves travel faster than longitudinal waves. Uh, and, excuse me, longitudinal waves, compression waves, uh, travel faster than S waves. Uh, I better stick to their terminology. P waves, primary waves, travel faster than secondary waves uh, and arrive earlier uh, at any station detecting them. And the stations are set up so that they can tell the difference between a primary wave and a secondary wave. So they can tell uh, when, the, when the primary wave gets there, reaches the station, they know that within a certain period of time, there will be followed by S waves. Okay, so those two main differences, um, what medium will they travel through? and how fast will they travel? Those two characteristics are essential to understanding, um, to gaining insight into the structure of the earth. Um, this timing interval also helps scientists uh, locate the focus of the earthquake. That is, where is its origin? And that is, uh, the depth of the earth and its location inside the earth. Where did it originate? Now there's the concept of refraction. The velocity at which uh, these body waves move is dependent upon the density of the interior of the earth. So for, for uh, denser media, the uh, the waves, the body waves, either one, P or S waves, will move faster. Well, if you get a variation in density, let's just say we have a, um, 
let's use um, let's use a, a piece of glass and light as our example. I, you remember when we were studying light in in previous chapters? Uh, I think it was first semester. When light comes in, if you view light as a wave like this, and it hits the glass, and this is air, then you can you can think of the wave as um, uh, a line of people holding hands together. And if this side slows down, these others are sort of connected to it. So when it hits that, this is gonna slow down. It's gonna slow and these are gonna keep going faster. And eventually the wave is gonna be headed off in a different direction. That's refraction. Well, that happens in the earth too. So the, the denser you get, except that in the earth, the density is not abrupt, like going from air to glass. It's gradual. So you get the wave not going like this and that as it hits a denser part of the earth. It goes like this and sort of <laughs> does a smooth curve before it. And, and it may also uh, refract so much that it will reemerge on the other side of the earth. Okay, and that's because the density of the earth generally increases as you go deeper. And that just makes sense. There's more pressure, right? You got more stuff above you pushing down, more pressure, squeezes things together. And um, even solids and liquids, which are generally considered incompressible, with that much pressure on them, uh, they will become denser squeeze closer together. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> so the information that uh, geophysicists can get from the propagation of these waves earthquake waves through the earth uh, based upon um, how fast are they moving? Uh, what type of refraction do they undergo in the process of that moving? Uh, tells them, uh, it gives them information about the, the path of travel. And they use those factors to deduce the structure of the earth. So this is something this is an artist's rendition of what the interior of the earth would look like and the travel that the P waves and the, and the S waves might undergo uh, from a, an earthquake. Now, to be sure, the, earth is, the interior of the earth is not this pretty, right? These uh, straight lines here or these uh, perfect circles would be more jagged or undulating. The boundaries are not as pristine as they appear in this drawing, but we're gonna use them that way to illustrate the points. All right, so notice the, the S waves don't travel through liquid. So what does that mean? That means when an S wave encounters uh, a liquid portion of the interior of the earth, it stops, it goes nowhere. So for the S waves, you create a shadow. Notice that the S waves, they're curving because they're refracted, density increases as you go down, so they, ref they refract. So you can pick up S waves uh, on this side of the earth from the earthquake, over to this point, and then from here on, you get none, you get no S waves at all. And you go around to the other side, and you'll find that uh, this whole area down here is an S wave shadow, right? And we can use that information to deduce that there is a uh, liquid portion of the earth on the interior. Um, whereas primary waves, will travel straight through the earth 
well, not straight, they will bend. And we see that uh, this P wave, when it encounters uh, an extreme change in density, it refracts even more. And you see it uh, generating these different areas, these um, um, directional zones that can be very complicated. And some scientists spend their entire life studying this stuff. But you will pick up P waves on the other side of the Earth. Uh, that's uh, a given. The greatest amount of refraction that, that occurs, occurs at boundaries. So if you have a, an extreme change in density between one layer and another, then you'll see an extreme uh, refraction. Um, okay. So we build up a picture, um, a structural interpretation based upon the, uh, the characteristics that we've described for primary waves and secondary waves and how they behave and what types of um, uh, evidence they produce when we receive the signals at some destination. Uh, and we build up this picture. Let's see, this, there's gonna be a video coming. So we build up this picture of the interior of the earth with uh, this portion, the mantle, and then we get this liquid outer core, and then there's a solid inner core. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about those, but I wanna play this uh, video first. I'm pretty sure I think I have to click it to go. It is pretty amazing just how much we know about the Earth's interior, given that we can only directly observe a tiny fraction of it. When we learn about the layers of the Earth, we are told that the crust is very thin relative to the overall size of the Earth. But that is only on the scale of the rest of the Earth. Relative to the scale of the tools we use to study the Earth, 30 kilometers is a huge distance, and the conditions become terribly harsh quite close to the surface. The deepest mines only go down a few kilometers, and the deepest hole ever drilled is just 12 kilometers deep. Efforts to drill in regions where the crust is thin have all been forced to stop as heat at the bottom of the well increased to the point beyond what the drilling equipment could handle. No boreholes have ever come close to the depth of the mantle. Due to our lack of access to the Earth's interior, scientists must rely on indirect observation. One way they do this is by studying the movement of pressure waves as they travel through the interior of the Earth. This is called seismology. Unlike the surface waves we see moving across the surface of bodies of water, the waves seismologists study move through material. These types of waves are called body waves. They are caused by large explosions, storm activity, meteorite impacts, and earthquakes. The waves caused by earthquakes are the most widely studied. When an earthquake occurs somewhere inside the Earth, two types of body waves are created. These are often referred to as P and S waves, where P stands for primary and S for secondary. These names relate to the speed the waves travel. Primary waves travel faster than secondary waves, so they are the first ones to arrive at any point distant from the epicenter of the earthquake. Differences in the arrival time of S and P waves at different locations around the world is one way seismologists use these waves to determine the location or epicenter of earthquakes deep underground. P waves are longitudinal waves in which the particles move back and forth in the same orientation as the wave's propagation. They are sometimes called push waves because particle motion pushes energy along in the same orientation as the direction the wave moves. S waves, sometimes called shear waves, are transverse waves in which particle motion is at right angles to the direction the wave propagates. This is similar to the motion of a wave along the length of rope that has just been snapped. In addition to helping locate the site of underground earthquakes, movement of these waves through the Earth provides seismologists with information about the composition of the Earth's interior. The longitudinal motion of P waves can pass through solids, liquids, and gases, while the shearing motion of S waves only move through solids. Liquids and gases prevent the propagation of S waves. 
hotter areas cause waves to travel more slowly, revealing the presence of hotspots. Partially molten areas, such as the athenosphere, weaken but do not completely stop S waves. Molten regions cause P waves to slow down and completely stop S waves. All of these predictable behaviors provide seismologists with information about the region of the Earth waves pass through after every earthquake. In addition to the composition influencing the behavior of each wave, both S and P waves travel faster through more dense material. And since density increases with depth, waves speed up as they move deeper into the Earth. Not only do they speed up, the change in density also causes the waves to travel in curved paths as they move through the Earth. The curving of these waves is similar to the refraction that occurs when a light ray passes through an interface between two media like air to glass. But rather than an abrupt change in direction like we see in the air glass example, P and S waves undergo a gradual change in direction as density changes gradually with depth. The fact that these waves travel at different speeds at different depths results in some surprising behavior. When an earthquake occurs near the surface, body waves move out in all directions. Waves that start moving deeper into the earth encounter higher density material and as a result start moving faster. At the same time, they undergo gradual refraction that can eventually reach a critical angle resulting in them turning back towards the surface. At the same time, other waves, which stay near the surface, continue to move at a slower constant speed. The faster speed of the deeper waves means that at some point distant from the earthquake, the deeper waves arrive sooner than the shallow waves that took a more direct path. P and S waves do refract more abruptly when they pass through major transition zones separating the layers of the Earth. The distinct interfaces between layers, such as the transition between the mantle and the outer core, are called seismic discontinuities, reflecting the fact that seismic data is what allowed these regions to be identified. The understanding of how speed, direction, and refraction patterns of P and S waves are influenced by changes in the composition, phase, temperature, and density of the material they pass through has allowed scientists to infer a great deal about the Earth's interior. The first discontinuity waves encounter on their journey into the Earth is called the Mohorovicic discontinuity. This is named after the Croatian scientist who discovered it. It is also commonly referred to as the Moho for short. It is the boundary between the crust and the mantle. It appears in seismic data as a distinct change in speed due to change in the density of the rocks on either side of this boundary. The next discontinuity is the partially molten asthenosphere. This shows up as another change in velocity and as a weakening of the S waves. As the waves move deeper into the Earth, they encounter another discontinuity 670 kilometers below the surface due to a change in the composition of the minerals that make up the upper and lower mantle. The density of the mantle increases here, resulting in a speeding up of the waves. The next discontinuity is at the core mantle boundary. At this boundary, shear waves disappear completely. The disappearance of the S waves shows that the outer core is liquid. P waves refract significantly at the core mantle boundary, providing more information about the change in composition deep inside the Earth. The speed of travel and the refraction patterns of P waves is consistent with there being another seismic discontinuity at the boundary between the molten outer in solid in the cores. The disappearance of the S waves and the refraction of P waves create shadow zones where no waves are detected. Consistent with the liquid outer core preventing the propagation of shear waves, no S waves are detected past 103 degrees from the origin of the waves. The refraction patterns of the P wave creates a gap in P wave detection between 103 and 143 degrees. Like much of the best science, our knowledge of the Earth's interior comes from multiple lines of evidence. In addition to the movement of waves, scientists have gained information from laboratory experiments about how different minerals behave at different pressures, observations about how the Earth's magnetic and gravitational fields vary over space, measurements of how much heat escaped from the Earth's interior, analysis of minerals from inside the Earth brought up to the surface by tectonic activity, and the study of meteors that are made from the same material that the Earth formed from. If you found this video helpful, please consider sharing it and giving it a thumbs up. Feel free to comment with any questions or suggestions. And if you want to keep up with the content here at Science Planet, click the subscribe button. 
Thank you for watching. Okay. <clears throat> um, this, the uh, narrator used a number of terms that we haven't defined yet, but I wanted to, to give you that one early on so it would give you a flavor for, uh, in a concise way, a flavor for uh, what seismologists can deduce uh, from one earthquake. But as a, as a matter of fact, many, many earthquakes have been studied in these terms uh, to uh, refine and give uh, uh, better precision to the outcome of their deductions about the interior of the Earth's uh, structure. So, <clears throat> um, we now think that the, the Earth is composed of four distinct concentric layers or zones. Right. Uh, if we start from the from the deepest part, the inner core is uh, relatively small compared to the rest of the Earth, but it's largely composed of uh, mostly iron and some nickel. That that's what we believe. Uh, the outer core is um, a, a viscous. We say liquid, but um, Remember that liquids just, they, have, they can flow, they're fluid. Um, some are very thick, like uh, molasses in winter, which would be closer to the, the uh, consistency of the outer core. So we say it's liquid, but um, there are various grades of liquid, various viscosities. And then there's the, uh, the mantle. Um, which can be divided into two segments, and then the outermost layer that we are intimately familiar with is the crust. And they all have different compositions, different physical properties, uh, characteristic of each layer. Um, I mentioned earlier that the inner core was mostly iron, about 85%, and the rest of it's nickel. Um, and it has a radius of about 764 miles, um, which is a lot, but compared to the 8,000 mile diameter of the earth, um, it's a small portion. Um, the outer core we believe is liquid and it's roughly the same composition as the inner core. So, when you transition from a solid in interior core, inner core, to an outer core that's liquid, the primary difference between the two is pressure. The pressure is so great on the inner core that uh, it remains a solid, whereas the outer core is still hot, but the pressure is less, so it's allowed to become a liquid. The uh, outer core is about um, not quite twice as uh, thick as the inner core. The mantle, however, its composition is distinctly different from the outer core. And we'll, we'll say some things about that as we proceed. And then you have the very, very thin uh, outer crust. I mean, it would be, by comparison, it would be like um, an onion, peeling an onion. Take the outermost layer of the onion, the skin, the part that's kind of dried out, pull that off. That would be in comparison to the size of the onion would be comparison of the crust to the rest of the earth. Very, very thin. Okay, um, so there's a, a, another view of the uh, now these are um these regions these layers are defined based upon various things like uh phase 
composition, very much so. Um, and they're what we would call operationally defined. In other words, we define them because that suits our understanding of what the earth is composed of. It's not, there's, there's nothing special about it, except that it's, it's just different composition, different physical properties. So let's start with the crust now. We're going to go from the inside. Now we're on the outside, working our way down. See, it's, it's very thin, five to 11 kilometers. And if you're intuitively trying to interpret some of these things, sometimes I put uh, 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 English units in there to help you with it. But all you have to know is that the, um, if the value in kilometers or in the metric system is a certain value, then you can readily see that uh, that value is about 60% greater than the uh, English system. So if we took about 60% off of that, that'd be maybe, uh, let's say 10, make it easier. Say it's 10 kilometers thick. That would be about 60% um, uh, about um, 5 miles, about 5 miles deep. There's a difference also between the oceanic crust and the continental crust. Oceanic crust is very thin by comparison to the continental crust. So wherever you have uh, huge continents like North America, South America, Australia, Antarctica, um, Europe, Asia, uh, the crust there is generally much thicker. And in fact, it's extremely thick wherever you have mountains. They have the, the mountains tend to go, uh, what, the part that we see as the mountain has a root. So that thickness uh, is uh, exaggerated for mountains. But the, uh, um, the, the crust in the ocean is thin, crust on the continents is thick. And that's largely due to density. The oceanic crust is mainly composed of basalt, which is a mineral. We're not gonna go into those details right now. And the continental crust is largely composed of granite, which is less dense than basalt. So the uh, continental crusts tend to float higher. Uh, by the way, this density, uh, my background in soil sciences, uh, is approximately equal to the particle density of soil. So if you take soil and, and you can squeeze out all the air pockets and make it solid, its density would be about 2.65. Uh, whereas the, the average continental crust uh, density is uh, composed of granite is 2.63. Now that's an average. Um, the entire crust is not necessarily composed of granite, but a large part of it is granite. And um, well, we'll move on. Um, and there's a, a relatively sharp boundary between, between the, um, the basement of the crust and the upper mantle. So their compositions are radically different. And this was that the reference the, the narrator gave us to that, that discontinuity between the crust and the mantle is called the Mohorovich. Mohorovicic, discontinuity, or Moho for short. Named after this Croatian geophysicist. He came up with this idea. And he noticed, he actually noticed the discontinuity in uh, seismic records uh, at the beginning of the 20th century.
and um, the discontinuity that we're uh, describing here is not just between the crust and the mantle, but also between the mantle and the core. He noticed both of them. Okay. Um, there's another way to look at the structure of the earth, not just uh, crust, mantle, uh, outer core, inner core. Um, but we can change the operational definition to suit the physical data that's coming from uh, seismic events. And um, that region we call the lithosphere is the outermost rigid brittle layer of the earth, which incorporates the crust and part of the mantle. Right? So litho means rock. So you would assume that the crust and that upper part of the mantle would be solid. It would be rock and sphere meaning ball. So it's a rock ball. Beneath that uh, is the asthenosphere. And the narrator used that term as well. Astheno means weak. So this is the weak ball because it is uh, not normally what you would consider a liquid. It's more plastic. It, it can be deformed easily um, relative to the pressures that it's under. Now back to the lithosphere. Uh, I said it's composed of the crust and some of the mantle. This is where uh, most earthquakes originate. This is where the faults are, and we need to define a fault. A fault is simply a, a fracture in the rock, uh, which allows uh, movement from one relative to the other. That's a fault. There's nothing magic about that term. Um, the asthenosphere then uh, takes what's left of the mantle and uh, goes deep down to about 70 kilometers where it meets the, uh, let's see, I don't want to say, I don't want to uh, misspeak here, uh, approximately seven kilometers. It's relatively plastic. There might be some more mantle below that. Let's see. Yes, there is more mantle uh, below the asthenosphere. <clears throat> the pressure becomes so great now that it's it's no longer plastic. It's solid again. So this asthenosphere is the part of the upper mantle that is uh, more fluid. Uh, and this is an important concept to, to retain in the back of your mind when we get to a discussion of plate tectonics. So just keep that in mind. So here we have a very thin oceanic crust. We have a thick um, continental crust. And then below that, we have the, uh, we have part of the upper mantle, um, which is also solid. It's different composition still, but it's solid and it, it behaves in such a way as to produce these faults in the crust and this, this upper part of the mantle. And that's where the tectonic activity takes place. Earthquakes, for instance. Okay, now to continental drift. If you look at the world map just from the surface, and it's, it's quite a view from space. <laughs> we can now uh, get photographs and, and video from space uh, showing us um, on clear days, the outlines of the continents. Um, and if you look at these, you may see um, uh, a sort of a jigsaw puzzle type arrangement. You can, you can jostle the continents around so that it looks like they sort of fit together. Well, we're not the only ones that notice that. Um, over the past several hundred years, scientists have speculated uh, about the, the meaning of these observations. Um, most of them were curious enough to, to propose a theory for how they got that way. Um, but 
uh, gradually, uh, the concept of continental drift was proposed. And in fact, it was proposed by one particular person. Um, well, first of all, uh, this Scottish geologist, James Hutton, recognized these things and he proposed, um, we're getting there, we're, we're headed toward continental drift. We just haven't got there yet. This is the historical lesson. Uh, he proposed this concept of uniformitarianism, which is a big word for just saying that the key to the present is in the past. If we witness things that are happening now, we can uh, look to the past and say those same things were happening in the past and it's just a matter of time for those effects to be uh, brought forward and show us what we have today. And uh, the rates, the uniform part, the rates have not changed over time. Um, James Hutton, by many geologists, consider him to be the father of modern geology. He published two treatises in, in 1785. Uh, let's see, hold on a second. I thought we had. Okay, okay. Uh, I'm pulling my thoughts together here. <clears throat> um, and one of the reasons that he's considered to be the father of geology, he pulled everything together. Um, every so often in the sciences, uh, most scientists are um, an anal analyst analysts. In other words, they tear things apart and see what the pieces look like. And that's good information. But every once in a while, you need a mind to come along and pull those pieces together and propose a coherent uh, story or theory about how they got that way and why things are the way they are. It doesn't happen very often, but fortunately it happens enough so that science can move forward. And James Hutton was one of those people. He brought current knowledge together uh, in these two treatises uh, and made this proposition about how the earth came to be the way it is. <clears throat> um, this other fella, Charles Lyell, was another Scottish Scotsman. Um, he took uniformitarianism, that idea that was proposed by Hutton, uh, and incorporated them into his concepts about the origins of the geological forms that we see today. Some even consider him to be the father of modern geology. So um, everybody doesn't believe um, that Hutton was the father. Um, Lyle came along later and he, he produced a, uh, a rather lengthy treatise, Principles of Geology. In fact, it might even be considered a textbook uh, in 1830. So it was quite a few years later. But it wasn't until Alfred Wegener, uh, a German, actually a German weatherman, a meteorologist, who was also a geophysicist. So he was a uh, jack of two trades, so to speak, uh, proposed that what what they were seeing in this jigsaw arrangement was actually a movement of the continents. Up to this point, uh, people believe that, uh, scientists believe that uh, the earth was fixed. It was, this is the way it was in the beginning. This is the way it is now. It's never changed. Uh, Wegener proposed an alternate theory. Uh, he proposed continental drift. That is, these continents were actually moving. And uh, he said at some point in the past, and uh, 
the story is too complex to get into details right now, but he proposed that around 200 million years ago, all the continents were pulled together into one supercontinent called Pangaea. Pan meaning all and Gia meaning lands. So this one supercontinent existed and the rest of the earth was ocean. And what happened was over this intervening time at some time after 200 million years before the present, the continent started to break apart and they, they floated apart. He hasn't described how yet. They floated apart uh, into their present positions and it took them 200 million years to get there, right? So things were happening very slowly on, um, on a human scale, but relatively fast on a uh, geologic scale. So this is what's known as plate tectonics. He proposed that these continents were actually sitting on um, basement rock, big plates, and the plates were moving and carrying the continents with them. <clears throat> And this is this series of slides says, okay, now we've got um, uh, about 200 million years ago, Pangaea started to break up and you see that things are moving in different directions. And gradually they get farther and farther apart, um, creating oceans in between until present day where we now have uh, the continents positioned where they, where they are. And you can see this outline of South America and the outline of Africa, they would fit neatly together. And then Africa and Europe would smash up against North America on this side and they would fit together. I've got another video. I might add that this video is running in reverse, right? We're starting out at present day, the way things are, and we're going backwards to Pangaea. Okay, actually, I think we went past Pangaea, <laughs> went even further back in time, <clears throat> but you get the idea. Um, the Earth has been in motion for its entire existence. Oops, sorry. <laughs> I need to proceed to the next slide. Here we go. Okay. <clears throat> so what's, what's the evidence that uh, Wegener um, used to propose this theory, right? Uh, if, you're, if you're going to uh, step out on a limb, scientifically speaking, you better have evidence to back you up. That's the nature of science. If there's no evidence for it, then you're opening yourself to ridicule. <clears throat> Prominent lines of evidence were this. One, there was biological evidence. And uh, I'll just uh, name them and then we'll go into the details. There's biological evidence. There's uh, geologic features that we've mentioned in previous slides. And there's also glacial evidence. All right, so what do we mean by each one of these? Well, um, there are uh, species, biological species, that are very, very similar to one another, but they're located on continents that are thousands of miles apart. Right? So one of the explanations is they started off as a single population during Pangaea. And then they got separated as the continents moved apart. 
but they didn't diverge enough in their um, uh, evolutionary development so that they you could see similarities among them. And nowadays, we can take uh, samples of their tissue and compare the genetics of, of each one and find that they are very similar. Um, there are also, there's, those are present day species evidences. There, we can also look to the fossil record and see that fossils of plants and animals have been found on different continents that are exactly the same species. The fossils represent identical species on continents that are thousands of miles apart. Okay, um, so how about geologic features, continuity of features? Um, we mentioned those earlier and we don't need to spend a lot of time on it. They, they tend to have uh, this um, puzzle type arrangement. They fit together. Um, these areas in uh, Northern Hemisphere, uh, Caledonia, Hebrides, Labrador, Canadian Appalachians, they all match up and they're on different continents. In the Southern Hemisphere, we see uh, the, uh, the Cape of um, South America, Sierra Mountains of, of South Africa uh, and Brazil those mountain chains line up also. So if these continents had once been together and then drifted apart, we would expect some geological continuity. And you can see here, uh, if mountains were forming here and over here, then as they separated, you would still have the ability, uh, once you drew them back together, they would line up. Uh, this is another representation. Here we go. We got these mountains over here and they're color coded. They line up. Uh, you got these uh, Appalachian Mountains and various uh, other mountain ranges here. They line up also with Northern Europe. And that's the geologic evidence. Okay. Um, then there's glacial evidence. Um, there is uh, sufficient geologic evidence to suggest that uh, about 300 million years ago, the um, uh, areas that are now part of South America, Africa, India, Australia were covered in glaciers, right? So glaciation is a process where uh, snow falls, but doesn't melt. And it just accumulates over year after year after year after year. This is due to climate change, climate differences around the globe. So as they build up, they form, they pack down into ice and ice sheets can be miles thick. Um, but um, this glaciation was shown to be evident both on Europe and in North America and other parts of the world. Um, at the same time on all these different continents. So the explanation is that they were, they were actually connected in a certain part of the world where those glaciers formed. And we generally think of that as occurring at high latitudes. And that's basically true. Um, the glaciers that once uh, sat over uh, Canada and uh, the northern part of the United States, uh, just recently in geologic terms, um, originated in higher latitudes. And they, they actually migrated south to a certain point. So this is what it would look like. If you see evidence in modern day parts of the world for glaciation here, here, Antarctica, of course, Australia, India. They're, they're at different latitudes now. So at one time, they must have been at, at higher latitudes, either far north or far south. In this case, far south would have given you that uh, development of glaciers. 
Okay. Um, in the beginning, scientists were very skeptical of Wegener's theory. The one critical flaw in Wegener's theory was he could not explain how this uh, continental drift occurred. Right? All these lines of evidence were supportive, but he couldn't tell anybody um, how the continents moved, right? What were the forces involved? It was too early. There was, there was no evidence for it at this time. That came later. And uh, eventually, Wegener was vindicated in his theory. Because, like I said before, um, scientists believed that the uh, crust was solid and there was no way for a continent to plow its way through <laughs> solid crust. Okay, so here we come along in uh, 1960, an American geologist, Harry Hess, suggested a mechanism that would explain continental drift. And his evidence was based upon um, the discovery in the Earth's oceans of these ridges that run along roughly in the middle, uh, separating continents through the oceans. And he proposed that these ridges were actually areas of volcanism. And materials would well up in these ridges and push things apart, push to the side, push the crust to the side as it formed new crust. And by pushing like that, it would push the continents and whatever they were sitting on away from each other. And uh, the ocean has been mapped to show that this mid-ocean ridge system covers the entire globe. There were also other features in the ocean. They were, they were uh, deep, deep trenches, right? Think about it. If you're going to uh, create new crust here and move continents apart, what's happening on the other side? I mean, where's that crust going? Well, it's got two choices, right? Well, it's actually it's got three. But for the purposes of argument, it either has to pile up, right? As you move things apart, out here it has to pile up or one has to dive underneath the other. That's what happens at the trenches. These deep sea trenches are examples of where that moving crust dives underneath its neighbor. All right, so now Hess proposed a theory, this seafloor spreading, that supported Wegener's theory of continental drift. Okay, and this is in black and white what I just told you. Okay, now other supporting evidence. If we're going to view these ridges as um, uh, sources of new crust, and we view them as a conveyor belt, where they come up like this and they move the continents apart, there needs to be some, some more evidence because these things, this happens very slowly. I mean, you've got uh, ocean floor features that would suggest that, yeah, this is a reasonable theory but you need some really hard evidence that the seafloor is actually spreading apart. I mean, just because the magma comes up in uh, volcanic eruptions only along these ridges um, doesn't necessarily lead to the conveyor belt theory of seafloor spreading. So we need another line of evidence. And that um, came along not too long after Hess in the middle 1960s. This is called, this is referred to in terms of um, uh, remnant 
magnetism of rocks. In other words, uh, if you have a very sensitive magnetometer that can tell the direction of uh, the magnetic orientation of magnetite, it has you have to have magnetite in the rock. So when it's hot, the the rock is is um, demagnetized. It has no magnetic field of its own. But as it cools, if there is an external magnetic magnetic field imposed upon that cooling rock the magnetite particles in there will orient themselves with that magnetic field. And then when it cools, they're fixed. They won't move anymore. So what do you do? <clears throat> well, um, let's see. Uh, here's the remnant magnetism I mentioned that occurs when you cool a molten rock with magnetite in it uh, under the influence of an external field. So that's the remnant part. There's a remnant magnetism that is stored in that rock. So how does that fit into our idea of seafloor spreading? Well, as the rock comes up molten with magnetite in it and then spreads out uh, and, and uh, it's under the influence of the Earth's magnetic field, then the magnetism orients itself in that rock as it cools and it's fixed. So if it moves away and if the direction of the Earth's magnetic field changes, then it will be stored in the next layer of rock. And that's exactly what's been observed. Um, uh, there were ships that regularly from uh, <coughs> universities and um, and other institutions that would uh, that were mapping the sea floor, uh, primarily using um, sonar, but they also dragged behind the ship magnetometers, and uh, they would detect as they crossed over the ridge. The magnetometer would say the magnetic field uh, under the influence of that rock. And they have to be very sensitive and able to discern, um, uh, differentiate between the Earth's magnetic field and the rock's magnetic field. They would detect uh, magnetic direction this way, and then they keep moving, keep moving, and it would go whoosh, switch back the other way, and then do that as they moved across the ridge, it would flip back and forth. So the magnetic field was being stored in those rocks. That was evidence for the seafloor actually from the ridge spreading out from that point. This can also be detected in terrestrial rocks. Right? So it doesn't have to be seafloor spreading. It's, it's used uh, for, for other purposes. Uh, in fact, um, paleo humans, uh, when they uh, have their, their campfires, will heat the rock underneath and it will become demagnetized if it reaches what's called the Curie temperature. It demagnetizes and then when it cools, it remagnetizes oriented with the Earth's uh, magnetic field. And um, uh, anthropologists will, in concert with uh, geologists, will take samples from those campsites uh, and they'll carefully map them so that they know how the sample was taken so they can, they can tell that over time uh, the Earth's magnetic field indeed has shifted, changed. In fact, it's changing now. Magnetic north is not the same it was 50 years ago when I was a kid. Okay, um, these magnetic anomalies were detected in symmetrical narrow bands spreading out from the mid-ocean ridges. Um, much of this work, at least in the beginning, uh, came out of Columbia University's Lamont Geological Observatory. And that's a fascinating story. That just That's the reason I, I put it here. Just go look it up if you want uh, more information on, the, uh, on this phenomenon and, and the detective trail 
that led to that evidence. Okay, so how fast is the, uh, this formation occurring? Just a few centimeters a year, which is about how fast it needs to be to um, break up Pangaea into its present continents, the continental positions. Uh, this is a, a graphic showing uh, the seafloor spreading. And the Earth's magnetic field is the blue line. So it starts off one way and then it flips and you, you get a reversal of uh, the stored magnetic or the remnant magnetic polarity in the rocks. Okay. So uh, Wegener's original evidence uh, supported his continental drift theory. Um, and then the um, remnant magnetism also supported that. Uh, and now those two theories, uh, continental drift and seafloor spreading have been melded into a single theory called plate tectonics. Um, the continents are all sitting on plates. In fact, uh, there are oceanic plates as well. Right? You don't have to have a continent sitting on a plate. Uh, there are plates that uh, underlie the ocean. And they're in constant motion. Um, and th that's where the concept, uh, the re required concept of the lithosphere comes in. The lith lith lithosphere includes part of the upper mantle and the crust, which is the solid part. And then the uh, a lower mantle part, actually below the lithosphere, the asthenosphere, is the plastic part that allows continents to, to move and drift. In fact, the the forces that are driving that uh, occur at these mid-ocean ridges and underneath the plates in the asthenosphere, which is uh, if you heat something, uh, it expands, decreases its density, and wants to rise in more dense materials. So you get these, the uh, might call them plumes, uh, moving up, and then when they cool, they move out as more come up behind them, and they, they, they form a cycle, so to speak, of uh, movement of mantle that drives the continents away from these mid-ocean ridges. Uh, it's a cycling where new crust is created and old crust is consumed. That's one way of looking at it. Um, some of the crust though, however, uh, if you have uh, two plates coming together and uh, they're both continental plates, then what they might do is buckle, right? So it, it doesn't always drive one underneath the other. And we'll, we'll talk about that in a few minutes. I hope I've taken so much time already. Okay, these plates are under constant motion and um, uh, they move away from each other or they approach one another and they undergo various changes based upon the forces that are driving them from underneath in the asthenosphere. Now we've, we've identified approximately, excuse me, let me back up, approximately 20 plates. Some of them are very small, some of them are very large. Right? Some of the larger ones are identified here. We've got the South American plate, the North American plate, uh, the Pacific plate, entirely covered by ocean. 
Uh, we've got these minor plates like the Cocos and the Nazca. Um, Antarctica is on its own plate. Uh, India and Australia are on a, the same plate, uh, strange as it may seem. And then there's the Eurasian plate. Okay, these are the major plates, and then we have these minor ones uh, here and there. Oh, got another video. Let's see how long is this one. It's only a couple minutes. Take a look at the outer surface of our planet. It may look like one solid shell. But according to the theory of plate tectonics, this outer layer, called the lithosphere, is actually broken up into massive rigid slabs called tectonic plates that fit together like puzzle pieces, floating on a thick molten layer of the mantle called the asthenosphere. The plates slide around like slow motion bumper cars, traveling up to six inches a year. Right now, Earth's crust is divided into seven large plates and dozens of smaller ones. The boundaries between these plates are dynamic and violent places that make and break Earth's crust. The relative movement of the plates creates three types of boundaries. A divergent boundary occurs when two plates move away from each other. On land, you can easily see this. Diverging plates create huge troughs like the Great Rift Valley in Africa. If the spreading here continues, the Indian Ocean will eventually flood the rift, converting the entire eastern horn of Africa into a massive island. Transform boundaries are where two plates grind past each other in opposite directions. The most famous example is the San Andreas Fault, where portions of Southern California, including Los Angeles, are sliding roughly two inches closer to Northern California each year. A convergent boundary, on the other hand, is where two plates collide. The impact often weakens and crumples the crust upward into jagged mountain ranges. Okay, <clears throat> so we've got um, different types of plate boundaries, right? So these plates are moving, but they're not moving in space. They're moving on the surface of the earth and they encounter one another. So we have the divergent boundary. Uh, the mid-ocean ridges are divergence, but you can also get divergence on land. The Rift Valley of Eastern Africa actually uh, goes up through the Red Sea and into modern-day Palestine, where you have the Jordan River. Jordan River flows through a Rift Valley. Convergent boundaries where the plates meet, right? And they can do one of two things. They can either um, crumple up like the Himalayan mountains, or one can dive underneath the other uh, and uh, uh, disappear, right? And the, um, um, the Marianas Trench in the Western Pacific Ocean is a a good example of that. In fact, it produces the deepest point on the Earth's surface. And then you have the transform boundaries. Those are where plates grind past one another. Uh, and the San Andreas Fault here was used as, as an example. Okay, we mentioned the asthenosphere before. <clears throat> is beneath the lithosphere and is uh, maintained at high temperature so it's reasonably plastic as rocks go. Uh, you might consider it solid, but it, it can be deformed easily, um, relative terms. Um, 
And the uh, lithosphere can be viewed as floating on top of the asthenosphere. Now here's a concept, isostasy. Remember, I'm, I don't know if I've used this before, but iso meaning same, which means you've reached a certain type of equilibrium. And in this case, we're talking about gravitational equilibrium relative to buoyancy. Um, the lithosphere floats on the asthenosphere and there's a gravitational equilibrium, right? If there were no equilibrium, then they'd be moving vertically with respect to one another um, all the time. But if one floats on top of the other, then they've reached an equilibrium where this one's happy to stay here, this one's happy to stay there. Um, you could think of it as uh, dropping an ice cube in a glass of water, right? Initially, you get ripples and it, the ice cube bounces, but eventually it settles down to uh, a point where it's 10% above the water and 90% below. That's isostasy. The continental plates under these conditions float much higher because they are less dense than the oceanic plates. Remember the oceanic plates are about um, three grams per cubic centimeter and the continental plates are roughly made out of granite or approximately 2.63 uh, grams per cubic centimeter. So they're less dense. And the isostatic point is the continental pl plates float higher. So that means that uh, water drains off of them into the lower regions, forming the oceans. So at any one time, you can view all of these plates in isostatic equilibrium. Okay. Um, the uh, mountain ranges are simply thicker masses of continental material, and that's why they float higher but they still have their roots. They still have high points and low points, like my drawing. And in order to be isostatic equilibrium, some of that has to be below the rest of the crust. Uh, okay, okay, so they're using icebergs as an example here. Iceberg is in isostatic equilibrium when 90% is below the surface and 10% is above the surface. And when you look at uh, isostatic equilibrium for a continental crust, you find that it sits higher, but it sits higher uh, as a whole. So that means part of it can be below and part of it will be above the relative position of the lithosphere. Um, these, uh, I mentioned the movement of magma, uh, molten rock, and it's the way it becomes less dense and moves up. What happens is, um, what, what you get, what geologists define in this, uh, asthenosphere is conve convection cells. Um, and that's simply, um, based upon differences in density which changes the isostatic equilibrium point. So if you get something that's less dense down here in this dense material, it's gonna move up. And when it does, it's gotta go somewhere. So if it's blocked on one side, it moves to the other side. And um, if a lot of it is coming up at once, it's gotta spread out at the top. So um, at the mid-ocean ridges, it comes up and where can it go? <laughs> it has to move out. <clears throat> all based upon unequal temperature distribution within the asthenosphere and the upper mantle. And then as it cools, it gets denser. And at some distance away from the, uh, the rising portions will cool, become more dense and sink. So you get this cycle. Oh, here's an artist's rendition. So you get these uh, 
spreading places, um, rift valleys or mid-ocean ridges, and the, uh, the cycling causes the lithosphere to move apart at these points. Those occur at divergent boundaries. Um, now, when these cells are moving their materials, um, there is friction. There's lots of friction. Um, solid against solid um, is, not, is not well lubricated, so it drags the crust with it. Anything solid above it will get dragged in the direction the cell is moving. Um, sometimes there is so much resistance that the dragging deforms the rock. And then at some point, the forces are, um, of drag exceed the ability of the rock to resist, and it lurches. That's when you get an earthquake. That can happen with transform boundaries as well. They'll stick. And then the, it's just, it's going to keep on pushing. And at some point, if it's really sticky, it'll build up a lot of tension energy in there. And then all of a sudden it'll break loose and you have massive earthquakes happen at those points. Okay, so this is an artist's idea of uh, plates moving apart from each other at the mid-ocean ridge. Um, let's see. So um, why are the ridges taller than the rest of the ocean? It's all based upon that isostatic equilibrium concept. Um, as the mid-ocean ridge builds up, it's still light, so it wants to float higher. Right? So it builds the ridge. But as it cools, it becomes more dense. And as it moves away from the ridge, it becomes more dense and settles down lower because it's denser. So you're going to have the mid-ocean ridge. is kind of like a, a, a mountain range under the ocean. And then you'll have uh, deeper areas on either side. Now, when two plates converge, it depends on what kind of plates they are. I mentioned that before. OK. Uh, we can divide the types of interactions into three types, uh, and that's based upon the concept that you have um, oceanic and continental plates, right? So you can get two oceanics together. You can get two continentals together, continentals or you can get an oceanic and a continental. So there are three types of combinations that we can describe and that are observed in convergent boundaries. Okay. In two of these types, um, in two of these converging types, one of the plates dives under the other one. That's called subduction. One plate is subducted under another one. Now, guess which two? If you get an oceanic and an oceanic convergent boundary, one dives under the other. If you get an oceanic and a continental convergent, one dives under the other. Typically, the oceanic one dives under the continental because the continental is lighter material. So the heavier oceanic plate dives underneath the continental. Uh, when you get two oceanics coming together, um, your guess is as good as mine. 
but one of them will go down. And then when you get two continentals coming together, um, you get a collision. So this subduction zone is defined as where this happens. Okay, for two oceanic plates, they have essentially the same density, about three grams per cubic centimeter. Uh, eventually, one is subducted beneath the other. I'm not, I'm not real clear why that happens. You would expect them to sort of pile up as well. And that may happen on a limited, uh, a local scale, but eventually uh, the one plate dives underneath the other one. And that's where these trenches form. Um, I will say this, I can think of one example where two oceanic come together. Uh, well, actually it's more evidence than it is a reason. Uh, in the Western Pacific, uh, places like the Philippines um, and the, uh, the, the Western Marianas Islands, um, you find that when one plate dives under the other, then when it does, as it goes deeper, it heats up. And that crust that was solid before melts. And sometimes it erupts through the overlying plate and makes these islands. So you get these island chains. Uh, the Japanese islands are a perfect example of that. They were formed by volcanic action of two oceanic plates converging. And that's exactly what this statement says. <laughs> it forms those, that island arc that overrides the uh, upper plate. Okay. So this is what you would see where you have uh, oceanic and oceanic convergence. Oceanic and continental convergence uh, is a given. The continent, the continental plate is much lighter, so it's definitely going to be on top, and the oceanic plate is subducted. So you, you tend to get a trench where the subduction occurs, and off the, the uh, uh, west coast of uh, northwest the America and eastern, western Canada, um, you get that trench forming. Uh, and then um, the crust descends underneath and melts. And then the, the magma, the, the molten material is lighter and it pushes its way up through the crust and produces a volcanic mountain change ranges. Uh, the, the Andes Mountains are an example. The Cascade Mountains of the Northwestern uh, United States are all volcanic mountains from this oceanic continental convergence. Okay. So that's what happened when Mount St. Helens blew up in, um, let's see, when was it? Uh, 1990, I think. Oops. Uh, yeah, and the, the mountain range generally runs parallel to the trench or to the convergent boundary between the two. These are Andes Mountains. This ha I don't know how long ago this happened, but that's an old model of the uh, Volkswagen Beetle. Of course, in South America, they, they make cars go for 25, 30, 40 years. Uh, Cascade Mountains, and you see uh, a peak back here in the, in the distance. That's a volcano. It may be sleeping right now, but it was formed from volcanic activity. When you get two continents coming together, they both have relatively low densities. Um, 
And subduction, while it may occur to a certain extent, uh, is minimal. Subduction can occur, but when it does, they're both floating above the asthenosphere and they tend to pile up in the mountain ranges. The Himalayan mountains are the youngest mountains on the planet. The Appalachian mountains are the oldest uh, of this type of mountain range. And the Alps are somewhere in between, as far as age goes. Um, so you get these two uh, plates sort of um, suturing themselves together when they do. Now, how about transform boundaries? These are roughly linear zones, although on the surface, they may not look so linear unless you really go way up and look at them off in the distance. They tend to form a relatively straight line, but on the surface of the earth, they can be pretty zigzaggy. So you have this zone of shearing, a point where the transform takes place. You don't create crust, you don't destroy crust when this is happening. There's no subduction whatsoever. And there's no magma coming up either. Right? So in those movies where they show uh, um, volcanic activity and, and magma coming up in the streets of Los Angeles, <laughs> and that's fiction. It won't happen. So when, when energy is stored up in these transforms and then released suddenly, that's when you get the most violent earthquakes. And they're, these areas are said to be seismically active. Now, there's some, there's some regions of the world where seismic activity is regular and repeated, constant. Uh, it occurs uh, many, many times over a single lifetime. Those are very seismically active. But there are some places uh, in where you would not expect these... Uh, transform boundaries to exist or these faults to occur. Um, and when you get an earthquake in those regions, it's a complete surprise to geologists. Um, one famous one occurred um, near St. Louis along the Mississippi River. Uh, I forget the details, but uh, the point is when it occurred, it was a complete surprise. And it, it actually changed the course of the Mississippi River when it happened. Uh, we even get earthquakes in the, in the eastern United States. Um, they're not big ones, but they're detectable. Now, I mentioned geology on other planets. Sure. Geology does occur and has occurred in the past. Mars is a good example. You know anything about the, um, uh, the forms on the surface of Mars? There's one major form called the Valles Marineris, Monera which is Mars Valley. It is huge and deep uh, and old. It's, it's no longer forming. And we notice that uh, along this fault line, um, we can pick out a feature here along that line and a matching feature on this side, which is offset. So at one time, Mars was geologically active. Uh, no longer. We now believe that the interior of Mars is too cold to produce geologic activity. Okay, um, how about volcanoes, right? Everybody has a, a picture in their mind when we say the word volcano. Usually think of this pyramid-shaped or cone-shaped structure um, being a volcano. But uh, in geologic terms, uh, volcano is simply 
a vent in the Earth's surface that uh, is a uh, a point of exit for molten rock and gases to escape from the interior of the Earth. So it doesn't have to have a cone, but many do have that cone shape, but not all of them. Um, perfect example, all of Yellowstone Park in northwestern Wyoming is a volcano. In fact, it's a super volcano. And if it were to erupt, as it has in previous uh, centuries, not centuries, uh, hundreds of thousands of years apart, uh, if it were to erupt now, as it has in the past, it would be devastating for the North American continent. Now, specific occurrences of volcanoes are very difficult to predict, but um, potential eruptions can be given probabilities, right? especially if the volcanic activity has been regular in the recent past. Then we get some idea as to the, the personality of the volcano. And it appears that uh, all volcanoes have their own personality. Um, we like to think of, of uh, geology as just another scientist where you can slap numbers on it, do calculations and spit out answers. But it's not that easy, especially where the earth is concerned. Most volcanoes, most that occur on the surface of the earth occur at plate boundaries. Right? So when you get these subductions, uh, you generate volcanoes, uh, primarily. Uh, you also get some along the mid-ocean ridges, right? Or near the rift valleys. Uh, Kilimanjaro is one example of that in Eastern Africa. Um, but you also get volcanoes in unlikely spots. The Hawaiian Islands are uh, examples of volcanoes at what we call hot spots. They're discontinuities, they're weaknesses in the Earth's crust that allow molten material to escape to the surface. But like I said before, most volcanoes occur. Uh, along plate boundaries. And if you, if you follow this line around here, follow this line of volcanoes up here, over here, and then down here, that's known as the ring of fire. These volcanoes surround the Pacific Ocean, so to speak. Um, we mentioned how these volcanoes form from colliding plates, so I'm not going to uh, beat that horse anymore. Okay, we mentioned the, the Japanese islands are um, volcanic island arcs formed from uh, at the convergence of uh, two plates, two ocean plates. So I've made reference to earthquakes in the past. Um, a generic definition for an earthquake is simply a sudden release of energy due to movement in the Earth's crust uh, and mantle, in the lithosphere. So it could be in the crust or it could be the uh, extreme upper mantle. And what it does is it releases stress. Right? Anytime you get that movement, there had to be some buildup of stress in order to cause the movement to occur. Now, if you get um, movement of, of plates past one another, and they do so with uh, regular unimpeded motion, earthquakes are unlikely to occur uh, with lots of energy release, maybe a little bit of energy release. But uh, the ones that are really dangerous, are the ones that stick and hang on to their position for a long time, and then when the energy is released, all that pent up energy is released at once. 
seismology, the study of earthquakes. Uh, and <laughs> that's an understatement. Earthquakes cause the Earth's surface to vibrate and result in violent movement. Okay. Um, now, when this movement occurs, these vibrations propagate in all directions to, to the sides and down into the Earth. Now, if we were um, paleo humans um, and we were living in uh, uh, mud huts or we had tents or whatever, then an earthquake would, would shake the ground and it'd be kind of scary, but it wouldn't cause a lot of damage. Most of the damage occurs uh, on man-made structures that collapse. And historically, man-made structures were made of stone and then later of uh, um, adobe, mud bricks. So when an earthquake occurs, um, those structures can collapse. And that's what causes uh, death and destruction. <laughs> okay, so like I said before, when the lithosphere moves one plate relative to the other, uh, or uh, one side of a fault relative to the other, you get an earthquake. Um, most of the time. Sometimes you can get uh, earthquakes caused by volcanic eruptions, right? Anytime you release energy in the Earth's crust, uh, you can feel it as a vibration. So volcanic activity is perfectly logical to have caused earthquakes. And some volcanic activity is uh, propagated and precipitated by earthquakes. They sort of go hand in hand sometimes. Mount St. Helens is a perfect example. Um, it was being monitored for uh, seismic activity uh, before the big explosion occurred. And what happened was uh, uh, several earthquakes occurred and caused unstable an unstable part of the mountain on the north slope to just slough away. What that did was it released all the overburden and pressure against this pent up uh, magma and gases underneath, and they came blowing out. So the eruption was precipitated by an earthquake, but the, the uh, earthquake was caused by the accumulation of magma. So they sort of fit together. Okay, this uh, faulting is a good source for uh, earthquakes. So if you can identify faults from previous earthquakes that have occurred, uh, like the San Andreas Fault in California, um, then you know where to place your instruments and, and watch movement. In fact, um, you can uh, set uh, a peg on one side of the fault and a peg on the other side and watch how they move relative to one another and judge how fast the thing is moving. And if it stops moving over a long period of time, you say, uh-oh, <laughs> something's gonna happen. Something's gotta give. Okay, <clears throat> that's all old information. Um, to a certain extent, rocks are elastic, but they do have their limits. They can, they can store up energy, kind of like a rubber band. Right? You can store up energy in a rubber band and it won't break, right? But if you turn it loose, all that energy is going to come snapping against that other hand. Right? <clears throat> so when energy is released, earthquakes occur. That's the takeaway. So here we have a map of earthquakes, right? And notice the earthquakes also follow plate boundaries. In fact, you get more earthquakes along these mid-ocean ridges than you'd see volcanoes.
Now, <clears throat> one thing that we've also noticed about earthquakes is that you can you can get um, uh, pre-quake shocks, right? Little messages that the the fault is sending, saying I'm getting ready to do something. You can see them building up over time in the seismograph traces. Uh, and then the, the the main earthquake occurs, but then uh, it's got some settling down to do afterwards. So it might still move a little bit here and there, and lesser and lesser quakes will occur afterwards, those aftershocks. Um, Transform plate boundaries, we mentioned those, right? And they form the longest continuous faults, these transform faults on the planet. You can get faults anywhere, right? You could go to um, road cuts in West Virginia where they've actually had to, to blast through rock. And uh, as long as you disregard where the blasting has occurred and, and they've uh, created some cracking of their own, but you can see major cracks in the rock, you're looking at a fault. And th that's not a plate boundary, that's just the way rocks are, right? When there's a stress, um, they can put up with it for a while and then they crack. Okay, this is a major fault, the San Andreas fault. And um, it has, several minor faults that accompany it. So San Andreas is, is more like a system than it is a single fault. It's a, oh, they call it a zone. It's a fault zone. Many earthquakes have occurred there. A major one occurred in 1906, um, not in San Francisco, but close enough to San Francisco to cause major damage and loss of life and it was largely due to its uh, impact on man-made structures. Um, most of the structures were made of wood with poor foundation and they just collapsed. And then uh, any open flames just set the place on fire. Uh, estimates are that the earthquake was uh, Richter scale 7.9. Now, I know we haven't explained that yet. Uh, either the Richter scale or the Macaulay scale, but we will in a subsequent slide. Just take it from me, that is a huge number, a, a really big number. So that was a major quake in 1906. Um, there was also another quake in that region, um, 83 years later. So in 83 years, significant energy was built up in that fault and it released in 1989. And by that time, much, much more construction had been placed on those landforms. So there was more opportunity for damage, right? Bridges, buildings, uh, highways in general were devastated. You can't control the fault. There's just, I mean, we don't have the technology or the sufficient knowledge to know how to control the fault. The best you can do is try to predict and prepare. Okay, this is a scene of uh, San Francisco, picture that was taken after the destruction. And you can see in, in various places, uh, scorching along the sides of the buildings where much of the damage was fire. I say wood construction, um, but not all of it was wood. Some was masonry, but it was not stable masonry. Uh, it, was, it was very easily broken apart and brought to the ground. But fires did develop and they killed a lot of people. And of course, once the fires developed, uh, and the earthquake had severed water lines, uh, you couldn't get water to the fires to put them out. So they just kept burning until they ran out of fuel. Okay, so here's San Andreas Fault. 
it's actually an extension, uh, a, uh, a point at which the Pacific plate and the North American plate come together. And instead of colliding with one another, um, converging with one another, they slide past one another. Right in the in the uh, this uh, what do they call it? The Bay of Baja uh, is a uh, has has the fault running straight through it, and then it comes on land and runs through Southern California through San Francisco. So from this height, it looks like a straight line, right? But if you try to match landforms on either side, you'll find that that they don't match because they've been moving past one another. You have to, you have to sort of uh, mentally slide them in one direction or another. Probably, uh, let's see, I'm not sure which side is the ocean, but the ocean side would be slid south relative to the other, and then you might find a point where they would match landforms. Okay, so how do we describe um, and something about an earthquake so we can get a handle on where it's occurring and uh, why it's occurring in that place. Well, um, for the earthquake itself, the focus is the exact point in the fault where the earthquake originates. That's where the most of the movement occurs. That's the focus of the earthquake. So it can be several kilometers deep in the earth. It can be, uh, you can position it from the surface, but you have to go down to find the actual surface uh, where the movement occurred. That's the focus. Uh, and it can, it can be any depth whatsoever, right? You can go down as long as it's in the lithosphere, for most of them anyway. Um, uh, it could be at almost any depth. Now, um, if you go from the focus and go straight up to the surface, the point above the focus uh, on the surface of the Earth is the epicenter, right? That's where you're likely to get the most dynamic forces uh, applied to uh, anything on the surface is at the epicenter. So here we've got uh, an artist's idea of two faults passing one another. Um, the slippage occurs right here, epicenter's here. So you would feel the most energy transition here at the epicenter. So it produces these seismic waves that we described early on, right? The P waves and the S waves and the surface waves, uh, the body waves and the surface waves. Uh, these seismic waves taken together propagate out in all directions. And uh, they are monitored by seismographs, right? Those are devices that are designed to detect the waves. And they, they use inertia, right? They, uh, the, the pin, the tracing pin, is connected to a mass that resists movement. It has inertia. And then the whole body of the seismograph is sitting on the surface of the earth and it moves, right? So the pin with its inertia stays uh, relatively fixed and the whole device moves around it. <laughs> it looks like it's tracing, the pin is moving up and down, but it's actually the device that's moving up and down and tracing as it does. And uh, the height of that line that's traced uh, is indicator of the amount of energy that's produced, that's released at your location. Right? So the farther you are away from the earthquake, the smaller the, the translation should be.
Oh, here we go. Uh, this one actually uses a uh, light beam, right? So this uh, device, which I identified as a pin, uh, is fixed. And then the, the anchor frame and the uh, rotating spool, they move up and down. And this thing uh, traces out on that device. Now, how do we um, quantify the damage or the, the energy that's released in an earthquake? There are a couple of scales. One is the Richter scale, and the other is the Mercalli scale. The Richter scale uh, is an attempt to measure the actual amount of energy released during the quake. Um, and it has to be based upon a, uh, a standard distance away from the quake, because as you get further away from the quake, the uh, energy that you detect is less and less and less. So we fix it at a given distance, which uh, I don't know at the moment. And how do we do that? Well, you use the traces, right? You use the traces. And that means that the trace has to be calibrated some way to represent uh, a, a release of energy. The Mercalli scale, uh, on the other hand, describes the, the uh, energy released in terms of its effects. So in that respect, Mercalli is similar to our um, uh, tornado scale from the Fujita or the Saffir Simpson scale for the hurricanes which are based upon the damage that a hurricane does or that a tornado does. So the Mercalli scale is based upon what type of damage is done by this earthquake. Now that, that's a little sketchy because um, if the earthquake occurs in a highly developed area with lots of human activity and building, then the uh, damage is likely to be greater than it is in some open country. So as far as earthquakes go, probably, well, the Richter is also the most commonly used scale. Okay, uh, this is an example of the Mercalli scale and it has Roman numerals. So Roman numeral one is, um, you can hardly feel it, right? <laughs> On up to 12, damage is total. You can actually see the waves propagating along the ground and objects are thrown up in the air. Those are the two extremes of the Mercalli scale. The Richter scale was developed by a scientist at uh, uh, California uh, Institute of Technology in 1935 by, obviously, Charles Richter. Um, and it's based upon the largest uh, peak, the highest peak of the recording from the seismograph. And the attempt is made to correlate that, that size of the peak with the amount of energy released by the quake. Um, so uh, in that respect, it's sort of a relative amount. In other words, the number scale is meant to encompass the largest and the smallest quakes ever recorded. Most of them occur between three and nine. Um, you can feel some twos. In fact, we've had some twos here in West Virginia. The interesting thing about the Richter scale is it's logarithmic. What does that mean? That means in this case, that um, for each whole number increase, like from three to four, or four to five, or five to six, you have a tenfold increase in amplitude of the tracing. So if the tracing were, uh, if the tracing were this big for say a three Richter, uh, and a four Richter, 
would be 10 times as big. Okay, 10 times the energy released relative to each other. Um, uh, I correct myself. The size of the trace is tenfold bigger. But estimates of the energy released are only 31 times, or actually more than that, 31 times the energy released in order to get that difference in 10 times. Okay, so let me say that again. When you change the number from one whole number to the next whole number above it, that's a tenfold uh, increase in measurement of amplitude of the movement of the trace. But interpreted for the amount of energy released, it's actually not tenfold, but 31 times as much energy to go from three to four. So when you have a, a quake, it's at three. And then if you experience a quake later at four, you will feel <laughs> 31 times as much energy released. So um, this scales up logarithmically. So if you go from a, a four to a six Richter, you actually have 900 times as the amount of energy released. Okay, so it goes from bad to worse to ridiculous, to ludicrous. Um, now, you can't tell how much damage can be done based upon the Richter scale, because it's related only to an estimate of energy released. Right? So other factors have to be taken into account. Um, where is the focus of the earthquake located? What type of rocks are, uh, will the uh, waves be propagated through? And what type of rocks are structures built on? What's the population density, right? If you have a very dense population and you collapse buildings, you're going to kill more people or injure more people. And what type of construction is used? I mean, are you just laying rocks on top of each other? You build a, a wall and a wall and a wall and put a roof over it, right? You're asking for trouble in an earthquake zone. So construction type is very important. And there are ways to mitigate uh, damage to your structures if you know that you're in an earthquake zone. Okay. So, how about the foundations upon which you build your structures? Here's a, here's a perfect case study. In 1989, there was an earthquake in California called the Loma Prieta earthquake. It occurred on October 17th, 1989. There were some structures, uh, particularly in the San Francisco Bay Area, that were built on uh, fill, right? That was just dumped into the bay and created new, new uh, building, the new ground above sea level ground that you could build structures on. Well, um, that might have been good for real estate agents, but it was bad for buildings that were built on these structures or anything that was built on these structures. Why? Because the material that was that's built on that was not stable. It was not connected to bedrock. And it had water saturated underneath. And one thing that water does very well in soils is lubricates. So what happens is when you when you shake um, a mass of soil that's saturated, it tends to act like a liquid. It's called liquefaction. Um, in the Marina District of San Francisco, 
uh, across the bay from Oakland, uh, there was a significant damage because all of this soil was saturated. And when you shake it, it acts like a liquid. Try that sometimes. Um, let's see. You could use uh, sand, right? You get a bag of play sand and put it in a, a Tupperware container, saturate it with water, and uh, shake it, and you'll see it vibrate. Or you could uh, uh, put a, uh, say, um, uh, a fishing sinker, a lead sinker on the top of the sand, and it'll sit there, right? Make sure there's no water left. It's just the sand saturated. Put your lead weight on it, and then take that bucket and shake it. You will find that lead weight sinks into the sand. So here's what happened to the freeway. This um, Cypress Freeway built on that saturated soil. It shook like crazy. It shook worse in the liquefied soil than all the buildings uh, in the, the non-saturated soil areas. And it was a double-decker freeway, and the top deck collapsed and landed on some cars that had people in them. So there were several deaths associated. This freeway is now gone. It's now been turned into a, a green strip as a memorial to the people that uh, lost their lives in that quake. There's another view of it. Okay, so we can generalize with the Richter scale and what effect it would have. If it's less than three and a half, um, you generally don't feel it as a, as a real hard shake, but just a gentle maybe, but it's definitely recordable. Uh, between three and a half and five, five four, um, you, you can feel it and it can cause damage. Not much, but, but some. Um, if it's under six and greater than five, four, you have slight damage. And depending on what it's built on, the, what the structures are built on, you can have severe damage or you can have not so severe damage. Um, in the six range, you can get some pretty significant destruction over a, a 60 mile radius from the epicenter. Anytime you get into the sevens, you're talking major earthquakes. Remember, from six to seven is 30 times, 31 times more energy released. Serious damage. If you get over eight, you're actually going to see the ground buckle. It will ripples and it will buckle, break gas lines, set fires. It's really, uh, you don't want to be there. So you can get damage from um, direct vibration from the tremors, or there can be some secondary effects, right? Especially uh, in parts of California, when you have uh, heavy rains, the soil can become saturated and do the same thing as that bucket of sand. Once it gets saturated, there's nothing holding it to the sides of the hills. And if you get just a little shake, it'll come sliding down and bury houses, people, cars, Um, there was an earthquake in Alaska, 1964. I think I've got some pictures. Uh, that was a very serious problem. And a lot of the damage there was from landslides coming off the surrounding mountains. You can get fires that can be started by the tremors. Uh, broken gas lines will, act, um, will make it worse. And then broken water lines make putting the fires out difficult. Um, FEMA, Federal Emergency Management uh, Administration, uh, has literature. Uh, so if you find yourself in, living in an earthquake zone, you probably want to get hold of some of that information and uh, study up on, on how to uh, uh, survive earthquakes. Now, we've been talking about earthquakes uh, primarily 
on land. Earthquakes can happen underwater as well. Faults underwater. Um, I'm trying to remember the name. I can't remember the name of the... Maybe it'll come to me. Um, Malaysia had a bad earthquake on Christmas Day several years ago. And it produced uh, the fault moved in such a way that it dropped water from this side and pushed water up on that side and instantly produced a wave. And the wave propagated from that point out in all directions. And uh, the wave has an amplitude equal to the depth of the water. So if, it, if the water is two or 3,000 feet deep, the wave is gonna be that tall. And it's gonna move as a transverse wave out from that point. Well, what happens is the wave is that tall, but when it gets to set shallower depth, um, that energy stored in that wave tends to push the wave up. And when it reaches land, the wave traveling across the ocean, it might just be maybe that high. But when it gets to land, it can, it can grow to 20, 30, 40, 50, 100 feet high. It's called a tsunami, which in Japanese means harbor wave, which is where they usually saw them in Japan, in their harbors. Okay, um, now we're gonna connect an earthquake to a tsunami. This earthquake occurred in Alaska near the port of, of uh, Anchorage in 1964. The earthquake was registered at 9.2. It was massive. And it occurred offshore, south of Alaska, where the uh, Pacific plate was diving underneath the North American plate. And there was slippage, all right? And when it changed elevation in that slippage, it produced a tsunami. Okay, so several things were going on at once. The uh, epicenter was located um, 25 kilometers or about um, 17 or 18 miles deep. So it was a really deep earthquake. And the epicenter uh, above that focus was about six miles east of the College Fjord, 56 miles west of Valdez, 75 miles east of Anchorage. So it wasn't that close to Anchorage, but it lasted for almost five minutes. I mean, there was a lot of shaking going on and a lot of movement and a lot of energy being released. I'm going to show you a map in a second. So what happened was the Pacific plate lurched downward underneath the North American plate. So it had stored up a lot of energy. And when it lurched down, it produced that wave right in the water. And the wave propagated in all directions. It struck the Alaska coast pretty quick but it was traveling at say five or 600 miles an hour. And eventually it reached the Northwestern coast of uh, North America and Western Canada. Okay, so here's, here's what it looks like. The Pacific plate dove underneath North American plate and the lurching took place uh, along this plate boundary. And the epicenter was here underneath Prince William Sound. There's Valdez, there's Anchorage, and there was a, a horrible damage done. I got some pictures for you. Uh, by the way, it was the most powerful earthquake ever recorded in the United States history. And second only 
to an earthquake recorded in Chile in 1960, which was a little bit bigger, three tenths of a, of a Richter bigger, which is a lot of energy, of course. The tsunami that was produced when it reached the uh, US coast in the, the Oregon and Washington, uh, some points it was measured up to 170 feet high when it hit the coast. And um, 124 deaths were attributed to that wave. Here's some more information that you can get. Um, uh, all of this information came from this report. So I, I put the, uh, the web address there in case you want to go look for it. Okay, now let's uh, switch gears. Uh, crustal deformation and mountain building. So here we have uh, what type of convergence. You have continental and continental convergence here. And these great forces can cause fracturing, buckling, shifting of rocks, uplift to form mountain ranges. Right. You can get uh, two types, geologically speaking, two types of um, uh, reaction to these forces. One, you can get the rocks to actually fold right? Rather than break, they would just fold and maybe come together like an accordion. Or you can get faulting. If the rock breaks, one will slip past the other. And these, both of these can happen at the same time from the same forces acting upon the rocks. Now, when the rock folds, it takes on uh, several types, uh, several shapes, right? If you get if you get these two rock uh, uh, plates coming together and they fold, of course they're going to fold like this, but they're also going to fold like that, like that, and like that, right? So when you get uh, this A, you also usually get a B. The, um, the arches, the upward folding, are called anticlines. Anti means against, and cline means to lean. So they're leaning against. It's kind of like leaning against the wall. And then the, the other kinds that look like a trough are the synclines. Sin means with, so with the lean. So this is the syncline, this is the anticline. And then occasionally you get some folding that only occurs on one side. Those are the monoclines. Okay, these three types of folding occur when collisions occur, when you get these uh, uh, one plate impacting another. When you get the pressures increase so much, um, you tend to make the, the rock more plastic. If it's the right composition, then you can get the, um, the rocks to become more malleable. So you need uh, great depths for this to occur. So folding, as a general rule, occurs at lower depths in the earth, where you get more heat, more pressure. Whereas uh, cracking, right, before faulting doesn't always occur at shallow depths, but it's more likely to occur at shallow depths. And this, um, this folding um, is believed to occur early on in the stages of mountain building, right? When you've got uh, lots of overburden, and the folding occurs down here. And then once you start to, to uplift, to build things up, 
then you get these faults raised, uh, excuse me, these folds raised to the surface where erosion can take place. But any other types of uh, stress relievers would be more related to faulting than to folding at that point. Okay, so where do we see this, this folding? Well, in order to see it, um, you've either got to have um, significant erosion occur, wind, water primarily, uh, erosion to strip away surface. And then sometimes uh, where um, uh, rivers cut down through layers, they can expose evidence of this uh, folding. Or nowadays, you can get road cuts to show you some uh, folding. Notice that the um, uh, anticlines, um, as far as surface features go, the anticlines don't necessarily have to occur where you get surface troughs. Right? The anticlines are based upon their structure synclines upon their structure. So you could get an anticline here surfacing as a, a ridge, um, but an anticline doesn't have to be on a ridge, right? You can find it down here in uh, profs. Just depends on the erosion patterns also. Faulting is a fracture um, where uh, movement can occur between uh, the two relative sides. Faulting occurs when the rock is not as plastic. So that means it occurs at uh, lesser depths. It can be compressional or it can be translational. The stresses can be of, of either of those two types. If the compression is vertical, you get uplift. If the compression is, well, I said they call it compression horizontal, then the crust will be shortened. Uh, let's see, horizontal, vertical, horizontal. Okay, I understand. We need some pictures. So you can get compressional or tensional uh, where the uh, meeting occurs. Uh, I guess we're leaving trans transforms out for the moment. But tensional tends to pull things apart. And that causes the crust to get longer. Okay. We need to define some things here so we can talk about faults more intelligently. The fault plane. It's approximately a plane. It doesn't have to be a perfect plane right, in mathematical terms, but it's an approximate planal surface um, along which the movement occurs. Right, so that defines, that is the fault, the fault plane. Now you can talk about the, uh, relative sides in terms of uh, which one is hanging and which one's on the foot, right? The fault block that is hanging is the one that's uppermost on an inclined fault, right? So most faults are tilted, some form or another. They're, they're usually tilted, especially uh, for the compressional faults, right? They're gonna crack like this. They rarely crack vertically. So the hanging wall is the one that's above and the foot wall is the one that's below. We need a picture, I think. And uh, the hanging wall or the one that's thrown up, uh, the fault block that's thrown up is, uh, well, the upthrown side. <laughs> We're being creative here. Uh, okay, we got a slide coming that will put these all in perspective. 
the three basic types of faults, the normal fault, the reverse fault, and the transform fault. The normal fault is where the uh, hanging wall moves down with respect to the foot wall. So the hanging wall is the one that's above, right? So if we have a fault like this, the hanging wall is this one, and the foot wall is this one. And in a normal fault, the upper fault tends to move um, down with respect to the foot wall. And that would be simply a response to gravity, right? Because it's pulling this one down, and if there's nothing holding it, then it will slide down like that. So that's a normal fault. A reverse fault is where the foot wall, the lowermost side, moves down. So there must be some forces driving the foot wall down and pushing up on the uh, hanging wall. That's a reverse fault. All depends on their movement. These compressional forces will cause that. Um, there's a special kind of reverse fault, the thrust fault where the angle of the plane, see if this is 45 degrees, then if the angle of the plane is less than 45 and you get the uh, foot wall, the foot wall pushing against the hanging wall like that, that's called a thrust fault. Oh, okay. So now normal fault, reverse fault, and strike or slip fault. Those are the transforms the stresses are parallel to the fault. So even though they're tilted, they'll move one past the other like this. Horizontal motion. Okay, so here we have um, foot wall, which is underneath a hanging wall. Right, that's a general description. Now, if the hanging wall slides down relative to the foot wall under gravity, it's called a normal fault. And uh, if the hanging wall moves up relative to the foot wall, it's a reverse fault. And then if we incline that angle even more, like this one, then you have a thrust fault. Then the last one is the transform fault, like uh, the San Andreas. Okay, when we get two converging, two converging plates, you can start to build mountains. Orogeny, as we call it. We can characterize these mountains uh, based upon their, uh, we can classify them to three different categories. They can be formed from volcanic activity. Like you can throw up a mountain from volcanoes. You can have a, a fault movement, fault block movement, okay? Or you can have folding. And sometimes you can have all three at the same time. Or you can see evidence of all three in the mountains that are formed. They don't necessarily have to occur at the same time. I should qualify that statement. Volcanic mountains, they form from volcanoes. When a volcano erupts, it brings up material from uh, the mantle underneath and sends it out onto the land surface around it. And these volcanic mountains most often occur at convergent boundaries. Since that's where the volcanoes occur, that's where the mountains are gonna occur. Um, if you have an oceanic, ocean-ocean convergent boundary, you get these volcanic islands. And they, in many respects, are mountains from the seafloor up, uh, poking through the ocean. And they occur um, some distance from the, uh, subduction zone. 
the Aleutian Islands, Japanese Islands, the Lesser Antilles, which are in the Eastern Caribbean, are examples of volcanic mountains. Right, we've, uh, it's been several years now, but Montserrat in the Eastern Caribbean uh, blew its top and caused a lot of damage when it did. Uh, how about volcanic uh, mountains forming at continental oceanic convergent boundaries? Right. Continental plate always sits on top and the ocean plate dives underneath in the subduction zone. And when it does, it produces volcanic mountains. The Andes Mountains, um, in which the um, uh, Nazca Plate, which is one of the smaller ones, is subducted under the uh, South American Plate. Cascade Mountains in uh, North America. The Pacific Plate has subducted under the North American Plate. Mount St. Helens, it's one. Fault Block Mountains. Um, normal faulting, where you get this sliding of the hanging wall past the foot wall, can produce a, a tilting effect. Right? As you get this one sliding down, there's still pressure pushing up on the foot wall, and it tends to push it up like that. That can produce a mountain or a mountain range. And they generally occur and have landforms that are abrupt and steep on one side. So they, they, they rear up like that, they're steep on this side, and they're gradual on the other side where the, uh, the, the, um, the hanging wall slipped away, but it's more gradual. On this side, it's more steep. The Grand Tetons in Wyoming are examples of that. The Sierra Nevadas of California, the Wasatch Mountains of Utah, all examples of fault block mountains. Here are the Grand Tetons, right? They come rearing up on this side, but I bet on the other side, there'll be a more gently sloping example. Fold Mountains. The, uh, the Alps, which were formed, there's some controversy here. So I sort of took an average value. They formed about 70 million years ago. The Himalayas formed between 50 and 20 million years ago. The Appalachians, they're over 300 million years old. They formed when Pangaea was being constructed originally. And then when Pangaea pulled apart, they went off and stayed with North America. And the reason they're not as tall as some other mountains is because they're old and they've been eroding all this time. But they formed from folding as the continents came together, right? At depth, they tended to uh, form these folding structures. And very often, you will find at extreme high elevations, evidence of marine sedimentary strata. And you'll find fossils of marine, uh, marine life embedded in them. They've been lifted up in the process of building the mountain. So they may have started underwater, but now they're <laughs> thousands of feet above sea level. Okay. All right. How did the Himalayas form? Well, you may recall from that uh, that India was this separate triangular piece, and you can see it. You can see it moving across the Indian Ocean, and eventually it slammed into southern parts of Asia. And when it did, those two continents expelled any ocean that was between them and then 
since they were continental in nature, they just slammed into each other and something had to give. So things started folding and uplifting. Uh, I've got a slide coming up that'll show that. Here we go. So whoever drew this uh, particular one believes that about 80 million years ago, um, the Indian subcontinent was way down here and it was moving pretty fast, uh, continental, I mean, uh, geologically speaking. And by the time it got uh, near 40, between 40 and 20 million years ago, it actually made contact with the continent. And this region here is all Himalayan mountains. Okay, subduction was uh, a significant part of the movement of this Indian subcontinent. Let me show you. So when it was down here, it was riding a plate and the plate it was on was being subducted underneath the Eurasian uh, plate. So there you had subduction. But once you got continent against continent, then you entered the folding stage. And you get uplift. And the Himalayan mountains are still being built. Uh, every so often, uh, Mount Everest is, is uh, reassessed and it's higher than it was the last time it was measured. Okay, we're almost done. So here's what happened. There's the, the uh, edge of the Indian plate. And uh, this is oceanic crust, which is being subducted under the continental crust of the Eurasian plate. Okay. So my guess is that at some point, there were volcanoes forming back here, and there may still be evidence of them. But once the, the continental crust reached the, uh, uh, the Indian plate, reached the Eurasian plate, then you started to get the folding and uplifting. You can see represented here, folding. Lots of faulting, lots of folding, sedimentary um, deposits, uh, were uplifted along with the uh, mountains, and you can find them at extreme elevations. Okay. Uh, 